This is another day that the Lord has made. This is week nine where God has graced us with weather to meet in this way. Is that not incredible in and of itself? I'd almost consider that miraculous. Amen. Amen. That God has allowed us to meet in this way when we've not been able to use our building, when we've not been able to do what we're used to doing. God has still made a way. And I want you to know something. The faith of many has been stirred during these last nine weeks. God is speaking to His people. God is moving among those who know His voice. He is working in the lives of those who are yielded to Him. And see, here's the work that He's doing. At the very same time that He is blessing and empowering, listen to me, He is also convicting and calling us closer to Him. At the same time that He is for you, He is also mindful of the wickedness that exists in the lives of His people, and He is determined to call it out so that we might repent and be refreshed and renewed, and so that we might walk closely with a holy and righteous and pure Lord. You see, God is refining His people in the refiner's fire right now. We're beginning to discover who's really in this thing and who is just playing along. For too long, too many people have been allowed to claim the name of Jesus, to profess the life of a follower of Christ, but yet there's been no evidence and no fruit. And now, the line is being drawn and you and I are beginning to see who are the true followers of Jesus. Whose heart are for Him? Who is remaining loyal to Him? Who has persisted? Who has been determined and faithful and obedient? Whose faith has been strengthened at this time? And who has fallen away? Who has grown quiet and cold? And these things are coming to light and God is bringing it to light. I am mindful that all across our country there are churches these last nine weeks who have done absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. They've blamed it all on a virus. They've closed their doors. They've made no attempt to do any ministry whatsoever. And they've cowered in their corners. And the name of Jesus has not been spoken from their lips. There are entire denominations who have shuttered their efforts. Let me ask you a question, O oh followers of God. Is there anything that could happen to you that would quieten you from speaking the name of Jesus, from seeking to serve Him and follow Him? Is there anything that could happen that would prohibit you from declaring the gospel? For those of us who are followers of Christ, for those of us who have surrendered our entire lives to Him, we have pledged our allegiance to Him. We have given of ourselves even unto death for Him. There is nothing that would stop His true church. Now that doesn't mean that every church has to get on their front porch and have an outside service. That doesn't mean that every church needs to do Facebook Live, although many of them are. I'm not saying that because they aren't doing that, they aren't following. I'm saying they aren't doing anything. They aren't doing anything. And I am mindful that now, praise His holy name, He is beginning to show us where His true people are. He's beginning to show us who our brothers and sisters in Christ truly are. The name on the front of the door, at the front of the road, doesn't mean anything anymore. Now you can tell where the church is because the church of Jesus Christ is still going strong. The true church of Christ will not be stopped. It is not in us to quit, to lay down. It's not in us to retreat. It is only in us to move forward in faith in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Whether people are meeting in their living rooms, whether people are watching online in their bedrooms, whether people are pulling into a drive through whether people are making phone calls and sending emails and letters and telling their people how much they love them, reminding them to persevere in the faith, strengthening them with the Word of God. However it's occurring, the true church of Jesus Christ is still moving forward. 
pursuing the kingdom. I share this with you because for the last several weeks we've been preaching about reclaiming lost ground. And we've covered a lot of territory these last three weeks and I'm so very thankful for the time that the Lord has given us here. But there is one giant landscape in America that has been lost to the progressive left Christian church. There's a giant portion of our culture that has been given over to those who consider themselves progressive Christians. When I say the word progressive Christians, I want you to know that the stark contrast between a progressive Christian and me is the Bible. Is the Word of God. The place that it holds. The reverence that it deserves. The sacredness of its words. Its peculiarity is being different than any other book ever written. Being inspired by a holy God rather than written by mere men. He simply used their hands. They were His words. You see, across the American landscape, under the name of Christian, there has been an effort to distort the faith. To pervert the faith. To reconstitute the faith. To repurpose the faith. But can I go ahead and just tell you something that as a follower of Christ you need to know and believe yourself? Christianity does not progress. Christianity is not intended to be progressive. Christianity from its very inception, from the day that Christ founded His church through His death and burial and resurrection, Christianity has forever remained the same. It is the will of God that the people of God stay true to Him unconformed by the cultures of our days, unmoved by the wickedness of this world, firm in our stance, secure on the rock of Jesus. I share these things with you because I am burdened and I believe that the heart of God is even greater burdened with what is happening in America. Churches that were founded on the Bible, churches that had Wonderful starts. Entire denominations that were founded to follow Christ have been taken over by a progressive group of people who have no interest in following the teachings of Scripture. Their interests are following the ways, the updated efforts, the more acceptable, palatable views of those around them. And it sickens the Lord. It sickens a father who gave us something pure and perfect in the book of Acts through his son Jesus. That man has taken this and thought he could do better with it than its creator and founder. Man thinking that he could improve upon the ways and means of God and the teachings of Christ and the truth of the word. Man thinking that he could make it more acceptable, more popular. God doesn't need that. God never asked for that. God never gave us this thing and said, make it better, improve on it. God gave us this thing and said, live according to it. But yet many have refused to hear His voice. Many instead have been drawn away by deception. Progressive Christianity was known earlier as liberal Protestantism. Because I guess that was such a mouthful to say, they changed it to progressive Christianity. A relatively new term, probably within the last 15 years or so, you begin hearing this term mentioned. It, it sounds inviting. It, it almost sounds like something we should initially welcome. Progressive Christianity. In other words, a phrase that implies that Christianity needs to progress. And because we think of ourselves as works in progress, we think we're sure Christianity should too. But that's not the case at all. Christianity doesn't progress. If anyone seeks to amend or distort it, they're not making it better. They're making it far worse. Anyone thinking that they can change the basic foundational teachings of our faith, they're not doing us any favors. But they're doing plenty for themselves. 
This is a movement that is within many denominations. Entire denominations have succumbed to this effort. And even in individual churches, it's a movement that readily disposes of biblical doctrines. Listen to me. A movement that is willing to dispose of biblical doctrine and replace doctrine with teaching and tenets based on tolerance, inclusiveness, and experience. A blogger by the name of Elisa Childers gave a clear summary of progressive Christianity with these five points, and I want to walk you through these, and then I want to show you an easy example that I found. And then I want to look at what Scripture says instead. One of the tenets of progressive Christianity is this. There is an understood, lowered view of the Bible. In progressive Christianity, the Word of God is not elevated above all else. The Word of God is brought down in comparison with personal experience, other sacred writings, church teachings and traditions, as well as popular cultural norms. You see, Scripture is brought low. You would hear these words spoken in a progressive Christian church. Something like this, the Bible is a human book. Or they would say, the Bible contains the Word of God, but is not the Word of God. It contains it. You might also hear a progressive Christian preacher say, I disagree with the Apostle Paul on this issue. As if it's up for debate. As if God is interested in our disagreements. The word that He has inspired His people to write is unchanging no matter who agrees or disagrees with it. In a progressive church, the Bible is weakened so that it can be changed. In a biblical church, the Bible is exalted revered, recognized, and held close and sacred to the followers of Christ. We recognize that the Bible is God's inspired and inerrant and holy word. And we know that it is not ours to change or distort. It is only ours to obey and follow. Another tenet of progressive teaching is that feelings are emphasized over facts. A person's feelings become paramount in the conversation. As the Bible ceases to be viewed as God's definitive Word, what a person feels to be true becomes the ultimate authority. As Scripture is brought low as its legs are kicked out from underneath it, then all of a sudden, a person's feelings are vaunted, elevated, given a status near equal to the Word of God itself. A third tenet of a progressive church is that the essential Christian doctrines are open for reinterpretation. You would hear a word like this, the resurrection of Jesus doesn't have to be a literal historical event for it to speak truth into our lives. You know that sounds good, but it's a total lie. Yep. The Bible says that Jesus was bodily buried and bodily resurrected. To say anything contrary is absolute blasphemy to the face of God. Amen. To marginalize what the Word says about the living King of the world arising from the grave on the third day showing Himself to His disciples being seen by over 500 and then ascending to the Father to say that these are not historical events is to undercut the power of our faith. The Bible says that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. Yeah. To say that He did not resurrect is to say that we have no power. But in a progressive church, it's up for interpretation. You would also hear a phrase like this, the church's historical position on marriage and sexuality 
are archaic and need to be updated. They don't fit in with social norms. They don't fit in with the law of the land. And so the, the founding teachings of the church based on the Word of God itself have become archaic and old and they need to be replaced with a more progressive and tolerant view. I remind you, brothers and sisters, and I'll warn you, marriage is not yours to define. Marriage belongs wholly to the Lord for He created it, founded it, and institutionalized it as being between one man and one woman. You would do well to hold to God's view of marriage and to forsake any lie from the enemy as an attempt to distort it. But in a progressive Christian church, marriage is up for interpretation. You would also hear a phrase like this, to speak of a literal hell is offensive to non-believers. To speak of a literal hell is offensive to people who are not Christians. To tell them that their ending is judgment and hell is offensive. We need to reword this. We need to make this thing sound better. This, this is too judgmental. This, this is too bold. In a progressive Christian church, if the word hell is mentioned, only mentioned in a phrase like hell on earth or these people suffering as they are are going through hell. You would hear those phrases in a progressive Christian church, but you would not hear if you do not accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, no matter how good you think you are, you will spend eternity in hell. You won't hear that. Why? Because it's offensive. And their focus is not to offend anybody. God speaks harsh words towards those who would take His Word and use it in such a way. If, if there are followers of Christ in these churches, they will have much to answer for as they have allowed unholy, ungodly, and downright demonic teachings to take over their places of worship. Yep. I implore you, brothers and sisters, if you are watching now and you are beginning to sense that the things I'm mentioning are found in the church you're attending, I implore you to get out. Yep. I implore you to remove yourself from a place who would take the Word of God and make it anything less than the Word of God. And though you may disappoint some, you will honor the Lord. A fourth indicator of progressive Christianity in a church is that historic terms are redefined. A word like judgment doesn't mean judgment. It means temporary correction. Palatable chastisement, but nothing that would last. Sin is no longer an issue of black and white. Sin becomes very gray. And it's up to you as to whether or not it's sin. The word love has been totally redefined in a progressive church. They say that it means you can't tell someone that they're wrong. Instead, to love them means that you must support and affirm them regardless of what the Bible says. I've said it before and I'll say it again. You don't love anybody you're willing to lie to. You don't love someone if you're willing to lie to them when you know the truth. When you know what the Bible says... And then you give the impression that what they're doing that is contrary to the Bible is okay. You don't tell me you love them. That's not what love looks like. That's what acceptance looks like. That's what I want to please you looks like. That's what making plenty of friends looks like. But that's not love. Love is patient and kind. Love doesn't behave rudely. Love rejoices in truth. 
But love is always saddened by iniquity. A heart full of God's love is grieved with sin and cannot idly stand by and give others the impression that they condone it, approve of it, or affirm it. But in a progressive church, that's just what love means. Lastly, and I believe most importantly, evidence of a progressive church is that the heart of the message of the gospel shifts from sin and redemption to social justice. The heart of the message of the gospel, the purpose of a progressive church, shifts from we need to see people born again, washed by the blood, regenerated and set free, to this. We need to look for those who are oppressed in earthly ways and help them with physical means. You see, social justice has a place in our faith, but it cannot dominate our faith. Good. To seek justice and to love mercy are commandments from our Lord. To help the oppressed, to see the captives set free, to serve and give to the orphan and the widow, to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to give water to the thirsty, to take in those who need refuge. These are important parts of our faith, but all of these are secondary to the purpose of our faith, which is the life, death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and return of Jesus. That is the foundation of the church. And if we attempt to move our foundations, we will fall quickly. And what will it look like? People are no longer saved. No longer do people repent of their sin so that they might be restored in relationship with God. No longer are people sorrowful over envy and lust and greed and anger. No longer are people looking to Jesus as an example to follow, but instead they're just trying to do another good thing for someone who needs it. And I'm telling you, church, Christ is displeased when we even consider changing our focus and primary priority. You will never please Him by serving others and not sharing the Gospel. He will never be pleased in you getting a pat on the back for a good deed, but leaving Him out of it. Good works are encouraged in a progressive church and helping others who are oppressed is emphasized, but the blood of Jesus and the atonement for our sins is de-emphasized and sometimes even denied. Their focus is not eternity. Their focus is on the here and now. I want to tell you that God's focus is on where people will spend eternity. Eternity is in the eyes of the Lord. And you and I must see people with a lens of eternity. We must see heaven and hell in every person that we meet. We must recognize that they, just like us, are going to spend eternity somewhere. And it's going to be in one of two places. And it is our heart's desire that they might know Him and be saved. So that their eternity is just as sure as our own. To do anything less is not in keeping with the Christian faith. Jesus warned us of people who would teach these things contrary to His Word and life. In Matthew 7, 15, Jesus says, Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You see, there are some enticing things that a progressive church might try to offer. There are some words that they use that, that seem welcoming. But Jesus says they are wolves in sheep's clothing. And we must beware. 
Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 and 4, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. That is what is happening around us even now. The example that I want to share with you is this. I won't mention the name of the church, but they have an online presence and I was looking through their website and one of the headings of their website says, Our Progressive Beliefs. And the very first progressive belief, in other words, the tenets of their church, what they hold to, the foundation of why they exist, the Christian faith is founded on three primary calls we see through Jesus, they said, to love God, to love our neighbor, and to love ourselves. That's not all that bad. Love God, love your neighbor. I'm not sure there's a commandment in Scripture that says love thine self. As a matter of fact, I promise you there's not one. Because it's implied even in the words of Jesus that everybody in the flesh loves themselves. You don't need to be commanded to look out for you. I recognize they meant well there and I accept that. People, it's much better for you to appreciate being made in the image of God and being loved by an eternal creator than to despise the day of your birth. So I can go with that one. But the second one, put me at odds. It says this, For their church, the Christian faith, is our way of being faithful to God, but it is not the only way. Christianity is the truth for us, but it is not the only truth. And as I read that, and I read through the rest of their list, but I kept coming back to that one. And Scripture after Scripture after Scripture after Scripture came to my mind to say that Jesus is their way of getting to heaven, but that there are other ways. Later on it said that there were many roads to God and Christianity was just one train on one track. I would remind you that Jesus Himself says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one cometh unto the Father but through Me. That sounds exclusive to me. Doesn't it sound exclusive to you? Our faith is an exclusive faith. It's only Jesus. It's not one way, it's the only way. Acts 4 verse 12 says, And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Peter in that great message made clear that it's only Jesus that saves. John 3.16 tells us, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, and whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Sounds exclusive to me, doesn't it? In John 3, verse 36, John the Baptist spoke these profound and powerful words. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. In other words, the Bible is clear. There's only one way. It's not my way. It's not your way. It's not our way. It's the way. It's not up for a vote. It's not based on popular opinion. They're not doing surveys to see which way is best. It's not one that's given consent by the majority. It's the way, and it's Jesus. And that's it. It is time for the church of Jesus Christ to rise up and confront these errant teachings. It is time for us to love our neighbors enough to tell them what the Bible says. My opinion means nothing. My opinion don't change anything or anybody. But the Word of God is sure. 
The Word of God is sacred. And the Word of God will remain. And you and I are responsible for reclaiming the ground that others are seeking to take, pervert, and distort. And on top of it, they even say they're doing it for Jesus. I tell you, they're not. They are deceived. Jesus does not have two wheels. Only one. He can't be honored by someone making much of Him and at the same time be honored by someone making little of Him. The Bible says that in all things Christ must have preeminence. Christ must have first place in our hearts. He must have first place in our homes. He must have first place in our church. He must have first place in this world. And He must have first place in all creation. Why? Because only He deserves to be exalted. Not the works of man. Not the teachings of man. But Jesus. And church, it's on us to take a stand and reclaim this ground. To be bold. To be willing to tell our neighbors and our friends, you may be going to a church that's not in line with the Word of God. And I'm not telling you what to do. But you may want to consider what you're hearing. Weigh it against the Word. Tell them that. Weigh it against the Word. Are the teachings of your church in line with the Word of God? If they are, good. Keep it, keep it up. Support them. But if not, what are you doing? What are you doing? As a follower of Christ, you and I must take a stand even when it's not easy. I'm not up here preaching trying to see how many friends I can make. I have no interest. i got plenty of good friends. I don't, I'm not up here trying to be accepted by this world. I don't need their acceptance. Don't need it. Don't want it. But God has called me to preach the truth. And He's called our church to live according to His Word. And we'll do it until He comes. We'll do it until His return. We'll honor Him with our very last breath. Because He's worthy. Let's pray. Father, I give You praise for the time that we've had together. I bless Your name for the message that You've given me the privilege and honor to speak. Lord, I'm mindful that there are messages that are preached that many don't like. But Lord, if a message is based on Your Word, the rest does not matter. Lord, I am grieved in my heart and I know that You are grieved in an even greater way that so many have perverted Your Word and Your truth. So many, Lord, have mismanaged the faith. They've tried to repurpose the church. But Lord, we declare to You right now in the name of Jesus that our purpose is is just as sure as it ever has been. Our purpose is to exalt and lift up the name of Your Son, Jesus. Our purpose is to declare the Gospel, that there is salvation in no one else, that there is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. Our purpose is to walk by faith, following the leadership of Your Holy Spirit. Our purpose is to show genuine Christ-like love, love that is willing to sacrifice, because it's love that is willing to speak the truth. Lord, we recognize that Your Word is not one version of truth. It's not a version to be compared with others. Your Word is truth. We recognize that our faith is an exclusive faith. We recognize that apart from Jesus, there is no hope. Apart from Jesus, there is no forgiveness. Apart from Jesus, we stand alone in judgment. And when judgment is rendered, if we do not have Christ as King, hell is our sentence and it is well deserved. 
because we believe that, Lord, you have given us the ability to preach the beautiful message of the gospel. That forgiveness is available. It's not earned. It's not even a reward. It's a gift of grace. And so, Father, I pray right now, if there's someone listening who has never accepted the gift of salvation, I pray that even at this time, they would confess their sin to you. Lord, I have sinned. They would confess their faith in Christ. Lord, I know that you came and lived in Jesus. I know that you died on the cross for me. That they would confess their faith in the resurrection. Lord, I know that on the third day you rose again and you are alive. And I pray that they would confess faith and salvation saying, Lord, because of my faith in Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of all my sin to wash me clean by the blood of Christ. To fill me with Your Holy Spirit. And to lead me from this day forward all the way into eternity with You. Father, these are simple words, but when spoken with a heart of faith, the greatest of miracles occurs. Someone who was dead in sin and trespasses is made alive in Christ. And so I pray that many would be saved. God, we praise Your name. You're worthy forever and ever. And as Your people, we will serve You no matter what the cost. We consider it an honor to live for You. It's in Your name, Jesus, that we pray these things. Amen.